so I mean to to um, um, to skip some questions um, about your experience. So uh, can you tell me like what um, what happens? What are the actions that actually takes place? For example, when I press Google.com, I enter Google.com in my address bar, and and I see a response later. But what are the things usually happens in between? Sure. So I guess. Uh... The biggest thing is that you'd have to go to some, uh, you'd have to make a DNS request in order to resolve that name and find the actual uh, IPs associated. So that starts off with, you know, local to more regional to uh, the root DNS, I think, I guess, eventually uh, to find the source of uh, or the mapping for Google.com. Uh, when you send out the request, you know, you uh, go through the entire process, I guess, of uh, uh, what is it? I guess even during the initial uh, calls, you'd still have to make an HTTP request and have the whole, uh, um, you know, handshake process go for um, each request you have. Mm -hmm. uh, Google, uh, once it finishes that, returns the state, like the normal uh, web page that it has, right? Yeah. And um, so, what happens when so? We, we put the address and then DNS is resolved. Uh, you currently mentioned about the look from local to root. And then um, um, let's assume Google finally received the request and what what it does with that, how, how it processes it. Sure. So uh, I guess when you just get to the normal google.com web request, uh, it, it's just the, sorry, web page. It's just the normal, uh, I want to say almost, uh, cache response that it'll give you, right? Mm -hmm. of most likely they don't, uh, instead of actually hitting a real server, mm -hmm. you're more likely hitting some proxy layer or cache that's gonna return uh, just the response to you instead. Yeah, and, and for example, if it made first request and they do not have a cache personalized to my request, because even for example, google.com, they now have like signed in information, like they show your name when you sign in, right? Or when right. you so like part of that is not even uh, cannot be cached. But for example, um, uh, they even even I think they cache it somehow. But what if like it is not your subsequent? It's the first request. What how how are you gonna handle that? Uh, sure. So are you talking about you're already logged in? Mm -hmm. I mean, not uh, logged in. Like you are visiting. I mean, you are, uh, that's just very specific to Google, but generally like uh, you are visiting a page and that is your first visit in that page. You never heard about it, for example, or never visited that page. So right. how, how, how the request is handled? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean when you, when you're asking that. So, I mean, like, um, so you mentioned about cash. So, um, uh, if I if I visit the page, they will probably serve a cached page, which is fine, which is correct. But the caches are based on some probably um, usually historical, right? So if you visit yeah. that page, because every every visit is dynamic. So for example, uh, other than Google, for example, I'm visiting domain.com and I have a query string like a equals hundred. So it it will be one hundred. It can be one hundred one, hundred ten, hundred twenty. Something like that. Right. So if it is cached uh, just um, based on URL, that then everyone will see the same page, right? right. But I'm passing a different parameter, and now right. uh, no one probably in the past has passed that parameter. So how what will happen? I see. So in this case, you're talking about if, like you have a post request made with some body as the message. Yeah, uh, I guess if that's the case, then what realistically happens for a larger site is it's gonna hit some uh, proxy from that, it's forwarded to some machine mm -hmm. uh, that after, you know, uh, having that machine dedica dedicated to handling that request based on load right. uh, on all of the servers, which is gonna parse your JSON body or not the, well, JSON formatted, you know, post body, uh, call the related servers in order to handle it mm -hmm. uh, and then send you back, you know, your response, right? Yeah. And 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 uh, for passing the query string, it doesn't have to be necessarily post. Like Git can like can have query strings too. So you you mentioned that you have worked in um, Python. So did you work in Django or or uh, any no. framework? 
or uh, was, I, I ended up using um, Flask once, but uh, that's oh, fine. Time ago. That's fine. So, for example, now um, if we just um, dig a bit more, so I mean, uh, I'm not trying to like ask you a questions. I mean, if you are not familiar with something, you can ask me. I can try to explain as much as I know. So that's sure. fine. I'm I'm just making it a conversation rather than an interview because for an interview I need to see your profile, background, but it's not possible here. So I don't know. Like I could not. Um, I could come up with a problem, but I didn't know the scope of the problem. So I'm just making a discussion while we have limitations time. So when you developed an application using Flask, so in this request, um, so probably the, the the page was not cached, so it came to the web server, right? The uh, We can assume like for an Nginx or, or Apache. Uh, right. some, and then Apache found that that's a dynamic page. It's not something that I already cached or I know how to serve. So yeah. Nginx looks like it has an upstream configuration, like it proxies that request that you mentioned to the backend. Now your backend is, for example, um, Flask application. So how it works from there. Right, so I guess the main thing that you have uh, for a lot of these web frameworks is that you're allowed to register specific routes to handle specific requests and uh, usually that's mapped to some function, right? So mm -hmm. there's probably a bunch of uh, logic for the uh, application, it's the, the framework itself, which decides um, how that mapping for routing happenings happens. But uh, for Flask itself, usually you would have some decorator you can apply on top of a function that says on this route, run these set of instructions, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, as soon as somebody gets uh, say it's a get request, in that case, uh, Flask says this route uh, was hit, so you're going to run whatever code you want to run and then decide to return a JSON response, right? Right. Along yeah, I mean, the status code. Yeah, that basically comes back to the, uh, the HTTP server and HTTP server handles the, handles responding to the, to the client. Yeah, that's basically it, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, just trying to understand, like, um, um, also one important thing, like, um, when um, we initially, vi like, entered the address, client, are you familiar with cookies? Uh, yep. So, like, uh, what is the relation of cookie in terms of a web request here? Uh, so, normally, what I'm thinking of is that cookies just store, you know, some information about the user and the client, Right. right. So uh, yeah, when, when we make requests, we have that data uh, available. To right. Sample. So basically, it's the browser. It depends on the client actually. So if it is usually yeah. browser send that, but for example, you are writing your own client. If you do not send, server won't be able to recognize you. Yeah. So basically, uh, it's a it's an a, it's a tiny bit of information for the client, which client sends with the each request it makes to the server, and that way identifies if it's a returning visitor or, or, or like what kind of the, the, the whatever the purpose was um, yeah that all makes sense and did you work with um, um, what it's called oh you, you work with the database right do you have any any familiarity with any RDBM assistance I, I've used uh, some so, okay um, so what is the concept in the RDBMS, um, the, the atom, atomic, what, what it means in terms of the, in, in the context of database system. Right, so atomic uh, pretty much means that whenever you perform actions, it's sort of all or nothing, right? Uh, yeah. Whenever you have a transaction, you have a guarantee that either the entire set of instructions will run and you'll move from one state to another or it won't. Right, yeah, that's pretty much it is, yeah. And, um, so and and uh, where's the so yeah I mean if you want, if you haven't done work with this you can skip but I just I will ask um, do you know the differences between a left and left join and inner join? Uh, yeah. So what you're supposed to get uh, from what I recall is that when you have your two separate um, items that you're trying to join from your tables, if you were to do a left join uh, for duplicates. I think uh, you'd only t end up taking one of the values versus. 
Sorry, let me correct that. I think for the inner join, you would end up being able to select for common items, right? Yeah. Uh, versus the left join is only going to take items from, say, the uh, left selection, and then the full outer join should take items from. Uh, it, it's the union of the of the rows, right, or the columns. Yeah. yeah. So basically, from the left, we'll get whatever it is, and if it is empty in the right side, that will be null or or, or some empty values. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and also, yeah, the inner join is correct. Just the intersection, uh, so common items. Um. So. And and um, where's the purpose of um, what primary key and foreign key means? Uh, so primary key is pretty much the uh, I guess main identifier for each of the rows inside of your table. Versus the foreign key is a reference to uh, a primary key within another table, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which helps I guess for um, making the uh, one to many or many to one or many to many relations. Well, I guess it's not for many to many relations because you use a separate table uh, with primary keys there, right? So I don't think that's necessarily called a foreign key. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, probably in terms in the academics, that might be some differences, but in practicality, yes, like when. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, like when you refer a primary key in a different table, that somewhat becomes foreign key, right? In that table, it's a yeah. foreign. Um, uh, so you you said you briefly worked with JavaScript. Is that correct? Uh, a very small amount, I want to say. Uh, yeah. Just just to React or only uh, on the back end? Um, uh, mainly with with React. Okay. So yeah, actually, I I I have most of the questions that I drafted mostly JavaScript and mostly applies to <laughs> back end. So yeah, I I won't ask those. And um, so uh, let's uh, uh, like discuss a few things about React. So what do you love about React and, and why? Yeah, so I definitely say that uh, when I tried to use, uh, you know, um, front end, when I tried to write front end code before React, it definitely seemed a lot more uh, complicated, in my opinion, uh, mm -hmm. versus with uh, React, it's pretty simple to think of just everything as functions, right? And you only have your really simple unidirectional data flow. So when you want to reason about state, you don't have to look at a bunch of things uh, and how they affect each other, right? Uh, you just have to kind of look at, this is my specific component, this is the input it's getting, and this is what it's doing with the input, right? right. Um, I, I think that's supposed to be a one of the advantages that a lot of people think about. Uh, but also I'd say that for, say, um, debugging and finding issues with performance, it was pretty easy because some of the tooling, I remember using a, uh, a separate Chrome extension that let me find where I'm losing frames based on me using say a component versus a peer component, uh, or it told me where I was losing the frames and I had to guess the reason, right? And I found one of them was that I was re-rendering because I was using a component instead of a peer component. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as well as uh, some of the state was being passed in again when it didn't need to be, when I could have just used a, selectors and memoize selectors to um, stop, you know, re-renders. So mm -hmm. I, I can't think of, or maybe I just haven't been exposed to how you figure out those kinds of things normally. Yeah, I mean, um, debugging is different approaches. So um, I also use mostly uh, what is called React Dev Tool or something to inspect right. React elements. And also we have another extension, I think Redux Dev Tool probably. Um, for yeah. for for mostly debugging or or inspecting the store, um, so yeah, uh, I am sure like whether I have used something uh, what you just mentioned or maybe I, I haven't run into similar issues anyway. So yeah, I mean that that's good. Yeah, I mean the 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 benefit or the advantage of this re React, I think that um, the concept of this flux flow that's very easy to like think or or understand. It's one way in interdirectional relationship, so very makes things a lot of a lot simpler than Angular JS. Um, um, our application was in Angular. Then this year we have actually rewritten the whole application in React, and I mean that's pretty amazing. I, at the beginning, also we had similar hurdles of like understanding. Like it, this is a problem. Like when you work with something for several years, when you transit like try to transition to something else, like you try to map like old thing to new thing, and that's the that's the yeah. only problem. <laughs> yeah, 
so that, that is the problem we had like that if it's a fresh eyes then it's easy to understand but okay we did that in angular how can we do that react but sometimes that's an anti-pattern in react so we, we right. actually did did a few things things like that so yeah i i have a few other questions but i think i'm i only have four minutes before i leave because my kids is cool um close at two to 30 yeah. so do you have any any questions that i can answer before we um, 